Please turn with me to the book of Psalms. And we're going to start a new series this summer. We've been going through, in, in the summertime, I like to change it up a little bit for you. We're going through a book study typically in the year. Right now we're in Matthew. We've been do, doing that for a couple of years. And uh, I want to make sure that the word is remaining fresh for you. So we want to sometimes break it up a little and address a different pertinent topic, some sort of critical issue of our day. We've been doing that with the various um, messages on, for example, the climate cult. And after that, looking at what the true church of Jesus Christ is and looking at what even the, the universal church, the worldwide church, as well as the local church is. And for now, for this Sunday and the next number of Sundays, I want to just look at the book of Psalms and take a number of Psalms in particular to just draw our attention to the worship of the church. The Psalter was the worship book for the people of God in ancient Israel. Um, and it, it has always been precious to the saints, even at the time of the Reformation, after the Re- Reformers had come out of Roman Catholicism and justification by works um, and the false gospel therein. They also declared justification by faith in Christ alone, and, and uh, wonderfully they returned to the Psalms. They saw in the Psalms something that was to be sung not only by the ancient Israelites, but by the church of Jesus Christ, Jew and Gentile, one people under God. And so you'll find that in the Reformation period, there were many Psalters that were created so that churches could sing the Psalms. And even today, we've learned that there are a couple of new productions of Psalters, new, new hymnals, really, of Psalms. And so it's good for us to return to the themes that we find therein. We look at Psalm 1, and it begins this way. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. I've called the message for today, How Not to Self-Destruct. There are many forces acting upon us in the world to cause us harm, but Scripture shows us everywhere that we pose great danger to ourselves and to others. We have the capacity to have certain attitudes and make certain choices that are destructive to our spiritual health, to our physical health, and to our relationships. We can cause trouble or harm to those we love and even to our neighbors and those who are strangers to us. So while external forces may be dangerous to us, we don't have any control over those. But internally, we are capable of great evil. That needs to be understood. And the Bible shows us that our patterns of thoughts and behaviors typically come from one source or another. Just as our Lord reminds us that a good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. You see that in Matthew 7. So a man or woman who is redeemed by God through Christ produces good fruit. And a man or woman who is not redeemed produces bad fruit. In the old days, I think we can all agree that things used to be more black and white. The town drunk and the glutton and the fool were recognized as such. And the godly grandmother and the diligent father raising up his children in the fear of the Lord were such contrast to those living in opposition to God. Now, while it's always been impossible for us to truly know the heart of man, what the world presented to us were stark contrasts between good and evil. But what do you do if you see those even called Christians behaving like the world? And what do you do if you see those called the world doing charitable works and things appearing to be good and righteous? We are a confused world, are we not? 
Add to this the growing trend of what is called deconstruction in evangelicalism, and it forces us to look at the Word of God for answers. Deconstruction or deconstructionism is the term now used when someone has claimed Christ as Lord and Savior at some point in their life, but ultimately deconstructed their faith through a number of steps up to the point where they renounce their faith completely. They often blame the church as the reason they abandon orthodoxy. Essentially, they begin to doubt one area of their beliefs until they have unbelief in that area. And that doubt leads to unbelief in another area. And eventually, doubt follows doubt in many areas and results in total unbelief. But biblical theologians have rightly said that this so-called deconstructionism is not people losing their faith as though they had a robust faith to begin with, but it typically has been evangelicals who appear to be conservative who actually lean very liberal inwardly. And more and more they drift in a liberal direction over time until they give up the guise and no longer want to be associated with those who are seen to be too biblical or too conservative. I wouldn't even mention the term deconstruction if it weren't becoming a popular and growing way to describe unbelief. But the term is a euphemism, a euphemism, a kinder, gentler word for apostasy. I've talked about it before in passing, but I want to address it today head on. And by the way, there are now life coaches in deconstruction. You can now pay money to have somebody deconstruct and destroy your faith. The irony of that, of course, is that the person blaming the church for all sorts of hypocrisy leaves the church and then makes a a killing by destroying people's beliefs. Just a terrible, terrible thing. Those who are raised in the church are vulnerable to this kind of thing. That's what I want to let you know as are those who are Christians without a firm foundation. For those raised in the church, their faith becomes so familiar to them that they often appear to be Christians when they are not yet really born again. They can recite verses and prattle on about theology, but their faith is not experiential. Their faith is not from the heart. And by the way, when I use that term experiential, I'm talking about a term the Puritans used to talk about a faith that was vital, that was living, that was breathing, that was not some sort of dead orthodoxy where the truth was known, but the heart was cold. No, the true faith is experienced also. You experience the joy of the Lord pouring out of yourself as you learn from Scripture and the Word of God acts on you. Their faith is not from the heart, these who fall away. Those not raised in the faith are part of this phenomenon also, but I think one of the reasons it's a danger for Christian families is because those who grow up with Christ in the home but not in the heart will eventually evaluate their life in your home from a pagan perspective. There's no wonder that they somehow blame the church for various things because they're looking at the church with unsanctified eyes. They're looking at the church from the position of the hostility of the world which already exists toward the church. The world is already hostile to the church, so your children, if they do not believe before they're out of the home, they may go out of the home and become hostile along with them. And so we want to be be aware of that in our instruction of our children, in our speaking to our own hearts. Now, your children may appreciate that they were loved, But the more the world tells them lies, once they're out of the home, those lies are easier to believe. And for you as an adult, if you don't have assurance of your salvation, this could be a danger for you also. You may have been raised in the church or spent decades hearing the word of God preached. But the reason the phenomenon of apostasy is notable is because even well-known evangelical leaders have joined with the movement and done this deconstructing. So you can think of names like Joshua Harris, who once wrote books and did conferences in the evangelical world and completely destroyed his faith, walked away, divorced his wife, joined the pride parades and did who knows what else. That is just old-fashioned apostasy, but it's dressed in new garb. Carl Truman says this, in time immemorial, people have lost their faith 
It's interesting because now it's used with this pseudo-intellectual language of deconstruction in order to describe it. It's old thinking packaged in trendy postmodern language. That's all it is. And that's all the threats of the church always are, is just the same kind of a thing dressed in the language of the day. But there's a kind of a credibility that these so-called former Christians feel with the world. If they can say, I was one of them, but now I know the truth of the world. I'm outside that world now, and I believe it was false. Their theology becomes a sort of soup du jour. It's a mixture of every agenda that the world is selling, but the broth is poison. They have sold their birthright for this stew of apostasy. And just like Esau, who was parched and famished from the scorching sun, so they have been unable to endure the heat of the culture, so they self-destruct. That was the problem with Esau. Esau did not have that inward conviction about his birthright. He, he did not love his birthright, which says something about his love for his family, his love for his father, and his legacy. And so that's why in the end we see that the Lord renounces him, says, Jacob, I have loved, but Esau, I have hated. Why? Because he sold his birthright. He, he traded it for something so small. They self-destruct. I say self-destruct because they really cannot blame the church. They cannot blame the, their parents or their Sunday school teachers who loved them and who yearned for them to come to know Christ. They refuse the love of God through all of them. And if they do not repent, there is no return. Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6 says this, For in the case of those who have been once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. The idea there is Christ was once for all crucified. And so you, you cannot have this revolving door idea of I can drift and come back and drift and come back. The Lord says if you fully drift, you're gone. If you, if you drift to a point of total apostasy, there's no restoration for you. You don't play around with apostasy. Those are, those are one-way tickets out of the church. They are not round trip. The truth, as we'll discover in this text of Psalm 1, is that avoiding deconstruction or self-destruction or apostasy is more than just how you pray or what verses you memorize or how diligently you read your Bible. Otherwise, we would never see this deconstructionism. Many churches are very good at filling the minds of their young people with true truths of the Word of God. But many find that they still have this problem. Because so many of them were very much in the culture and habits of Christianity, we think that they were fine. What we learn, however, is there are those who are regenerate and those who are unregenerate. And Psalm 1 describes for us the righteous and the wicked, the regenerate and the unregenerate. And those are really the two parts of this passage. We could put it this way. Point 1, we'll look at the firmly planted faithful Point two, we'll look at the wind-blown wicked. The firmly planted faithful and the wind-blown wicked. The psalm is neatly divided, <coughs> neatly divided into these two main sections and a summary. Verses 1 through 3 tell us about the righteous. Verses 4 to 5 tell us about the wicked. And verse 6 is the summary from the Lord's perspective of both groups. Now, before we jump ahead into the exposition, I've got to talk about the fact that there is a very deliberate positioning of this psalm. This, this is the first of 150 psalms. The psalms were written by a small handful of authors, with David as a major author, with 73 psalms to his name. Asaph, the sons of Korah, Haman, Ethan, and even Moses wrote psalms. Of all of those, Moses wrote what we can confidently say is the oldest psalm of course he predated all these men in life and ministry we know that there were psalms also that were written during the exile so you're talking moses and then israel and all of its kings and the exile of israel psalm 137 which i believe 
is one of the saddest pieces of writing in, in existence, is an, an example of one of these exilic song, psalms. Psalm 137 says this, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. Upon the willows in the midst of it, we hung our harps. For there our captors demanded of us songs, and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? That was the love of the people of God for the place that God had set His name forever, Jerusalem. So the songbook spans this whole period and beyond. The songbook itself was compiled sometime after the exile. The newly rebuilt temple in 516 BC would certainly have been a prominent location for the use of the Psalms once again in public worship. So from before Moses' death in 1445 BC, 1445 BC to 516 BC when the temple was restored, the Psalms are written and organized. That is a span of some 930 years. It's amazing. When you think about the fact that the entire Bible was written over a period of 1,500 years, for 900 years of that time, psalms were being written and compiled. So you have the, the, a genuine span of the life of the people of God and the works of God and the, and, and the person of God in all of these psalms. So these incredible psalms that we've come to love and appreciate reflect nearly a millennium of the wisdom of God expressed through the righteous of God's people. And it's no mistake that the first psalm sets the tone for the entire Psalter. The righteous and the wicked. There are only two ways to live. As servants of righteousness or as servants of wickedness. Servants of God or servants of Satan. As believers in God or deniers of God. So first we look at the firmly planted faithful. Verse 1. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. The word for blessed here is at times translated happy. And it's a, a very true statement. Happy is the one who does not dwell among the wicked. Happy is the one who is not infested with the sinful lifestyle of the wicked. Happy is the one that does not do all the things of the world. And can we say something very evident, self-evident today? Unhappy is the world. Unhappy are sinners. Unhappy are the unrepentant. It's very clear. Some, something you no doubt are familiar with is the unhappiness of the world. They're unhappy, they're bitter, they're cynical. They are anything but happy. And the Word of God says the righteous is blessed. The righteous is joyful. The righteous is happy. Now, even though the first three verses of our psalm teach of the righteous, the first, so, the first verse does so by contrast to the wicked. So it's how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. To walk here is used in a figurative sense meaning to live a certain way. In years past, it was common to say to somebody, brother, sister, how is your walk with the Lord? Anybody remember that from way back in the day? Somebody actually coming to you from a church and saying, how's your walk? It's pretty important. And I, I think we need to resume those kind of questions for our young people, but also for each other. How is your walk? How is your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? How are you doing? Uh, my... My father actually, one time, one of my friends came to my father months after he had talked to him. Um, my dad had apparently asked him, how is your walk? And I was there, and I, I just didn't think anything of it. And uh, sometime later, he came back to my dad, and he said, thank you for asking me about my walk, because it wasn't good. I was not in a good place, and it caused me to think about the path that I was on. So these are important questions. And of course, the man that is righteous, the man that is the Lord's, does not walk a certain way. Have you wandered off the path? The question is often posed to us in different ways in Scripture. 
The Bible is filled with rich metaphor and picturesque language. The counsel of the wicked is man's ways and plans and knowledge. And so we see this idea of the path and the seed of the, of the wicked and the sinner. The wisdom of man is what is being addressed here. We don't follow the wisdom of man, which is to say, we don't follow wisdom that is not from above. What does James say about worldly wisdom? James 3.15 This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. Today, this is one who follows the self-help coaches rather than the truth and the worldly philosophers. And he follows the atheistic scientists and the so-called deconstructing Christians. The Christian does not walk according to their wisdom. You see this pattern in a subtle way with very small children. Kids will counsel other kids to do very naughty things. If you remember your youth at all, I'm sure you remember a time when even as a child, somebody said, hey, why don't you do that naughty thing over there? Why don't you take that little boy's toy over there? And of course, you'd be like, well, I I don't know. I don't really No, Take it. You're going to like it. And of course, if you follow and you go and you take the toy, you have committed sin And we sort of laugh at it when we think about it in hindsight. But as you grow, it becomes less silly, less childish and and less humorous. And it becomes more, more serious. Eventually, it gets quite bad. Back in my day, even I remember a boy saying to me as an early teen, hey, why don't you stop going to church? You don't you don't really need to go to church. And I remember even thinking to myself in my weak defense I don't, I don't mind church. I don't mind it. You know, I go there with my parents. And the doorway into actually following very terrible advice gets cracked open just a little bit and a little bit more and a little bit more. And of course, as you get older, the sinfulness becomes overt. Today, people will cancel you to consider yourself neither male nor female. It is a whole new world, but it is the same truth. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Some of you are in public schools and you have to recognize the difference between a voice that is in alignment with the word of God and with righteousness and with truth and a voice that is with the devil. They will counsel you in some of these schools to do very wicked things and they'll tell you, No, 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 the Word of God is not the truth. This other thing is the truth. In fact, whatever you feel yourself to be is the truth, they'll say, when God has in the beginning told you how He has made you to be. The next phrase from walking in the counsel of the wicked advances the danger. It says, nor does does this blessed one stand in the path of sinners. The idea here is moving from walking to sitting with standing as the critical transition point for the one who already follows the counsel of the wicked. Now he will settle in to the path of destruction. The word for path is a word that speaks of the road you travel. You can imagine walking along and being swayed by the wicked to turn aside to a path you have not known, like down a dark alleyway. And at some point, immoral men will call you over to spend just a few moments with them or sinful women will entice you to stop. And so you stand still. Not only does the righteous have a walk that is righteous, but he goes along the way of the righteous. Christianity in the first century began to be known as the way. In Acts 22, we see that Saul was persecuting the way. That's what it said when it was speaking about the church. What was this way but the narrow way that Jesus described for his followers? That is the way of the righteous. It is a way that faces trials and yet overcomes them all. The righteous know it and so they are blessed. They are joyful and thankful when others are unable to stay the course. You may be suffering through your life. I have known people that have suffered to the day they died, but they were in Christ and they had joy through until death. That's only possible in Christ. That's only possible as a believer to have such joy and hope knowing what is coming. The righteous does not walk in the counsel of the wicked nor stand in the way of sinners. 
And here's the next part, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. Here you have the whole picture of what the godly one is not. He neither walks according to the counsel of the wicked, so his lifestyle does not reflect evil. Nor does he stand in the path of sinners. He's not tempted in the path of sinners the way others are. This, is, this has a, a serious figurative element to it. But it's easy to see that it is literally going to show up in his life. And that's the truth with many scriptures. There are things that are used as metaphors, but they're actually true. Going the way of the wicked could mean something figurative or, or by analogy, and yet when you think about it literally, they are literally not following them into the place of wickedness. You are not going to a location with friends that you know are going to do evil. You are not following after them. You are not standing with them. And so there are real truths we have to digest here. To sit in the seat of scoffers is now to be the one who counsels others as he was counseled. You now speak against the thing that you were once first just drifting from. Now you speak full-throated against Christ, full-throated against the God of the universe, full-throated against the church and against the truth. Jesus in Matthew 18 says, Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks, but... It is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to that man through whom the stumbling block comes. Christ is saying, there are those that drift, there are those that perish, but woe to the one that goes to such a level they've apostatized and they come to this point where they now draw others away from the truth. They take those who are not yet believers and they sap away from them any light of the truth. They draw them into the dark tunnel. And they suffocate whatever good word that they had heard. Those who lead others to destruction are deserving of great judgment. The righteous does none of these things. He will not spend time at places where heathens dwell. He is not watching TV shows or movies which glorify sinful lifestyles. He's not spending most of his time with unbelievers who he knows always try to counsel him to sin. And there's another element to that as well. You are not spending time with other people who call themselves Christians that are doing sinful things and drawing you into sinful things, that are speaking with a sinful, worldly mouth, acting as pagans, but calling themselves Christians. That is one of the ways that apostasy creeps in, is through other people who call themselves Christians, but they're really wolves. And sometimes you, you know, you have to cut yourself off from her friends. They'll, they'll say to you, why, why don't you want to spend time with me? Why don't we hang out a little? And you, you just have to be honest. Listen, I am trying to live a, a life that is holy before a holy God. The only way that I can do that is by the spirit of God and the word of God dwelling deeply, richly within me. And I find that in your company, I'm always drawn to gossip or I'm always drawn. You, you swear so much. You, your mouth is, is a little foul, brother. You got to understand this. And, and you might just have to say that to your friends. Some of you think, well, you'll be a good influence on them. Just remember that bad company corrupts good morals. Very frequently, it goes the other way around. Learn to be around those who desire Christ and desire to be drawn to Him and speak truth to those who don't. Don't let them draw you in. In fact, the man or woman who belongs to Christ is one who is no longer drawn to the world. It no longer gives them the sense of fun and happiness that it once did. You can ask any drug addict or any drunk or anybody who is engaged in sin their whole life long, and even if they are still in that sin and have not embraced Christ, they can tell you, it sickens me, I'm tired of it, I know it's bad, but I have no power to overcome it. You, you find that the, the desires of the world eventually grow weary. That's why the, the alcoholic or the, the one who does drugs always has to have more. It's never satisfying. For the believer, he is satisfied fully in Christ, fully in the Word. And so he does not any longer dive into those things. Yes, he falls into sin. 
Yes, the sinner still is a sinner by his flesh, but he doesn't dive into and chase after sin. Now, here's the great contrast. Blessed is this man who does none of these things, but who is characterized by this, verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. Now, this verse is key to the entire book of the Psalms. The first Psalm teaches that the delight of the righteous is God's law, God's word. This, this includes the entire word of God, but it's important also to understand what the psalmist is saying and what the entire Psalter after the exile of the people of Israel to Babylon says, that the law of God is good. What was the lesson of the exile? It was that Israel had left her first love and had gone off after other gods, walking in the counsel of idolatrous peoples, standing in the path of sinners, turning aside to sit in the seat of scoffers. That is legitimately what the nation had done and why the Lord, in order to discipline her, had sent her into exile. So this psalm is reminding all Israel, you disobeyed because you did not love me. You disobeyed and I had to discipline you. Now, of course, this psalm may have been written prior to the exile. We don't know the date of this first psalm. But in the compilation of the psalms, those who compiled this were telling Israel, remember from whence you've come. Remember who your master and maker is. Remember what he's called you to. He's called you to this way. The true follower of Yahweh delights in his law. Did you catch that? He delights in the law of God. Not he reads it, not he memorizes it, not he reads it to his children, speaks it to his children, not even he preaches the word of God. The one who is counted among the righteous is one who loves the word of God. There's a delight that comes for the word of God for the righteous. The righteous actually doesn't obey just because he's commanded to obey the righteous obeys because it's his delight to understand the commandments of God and the word of God and the truth of God. Jesus takes us a step further when he propounds for the disciples what it means to be his disciple. John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. You see that there's an order to that. First, if anyone loves me. Second, he will keep my word. Love precedes obedience. Obedience, and you see this for those who become apostate. You understand that their obedience was never out of love for the Savior. Their obedience was rote obedience. Their obedience was mechanical obedience. Their their obedience was cold obedience. The one who knows God and the one whom God knows is one who is filled with love. And of course we say we love him because he first loved us. But the evidence that we are going to be able to even follow him is that we have a deep love for his law and that deep love for his word and that deep love for his word shows that we in fact love its source. We love God, the writer of Scripture. You cannot make yourself obey Jesus if you don't love Jesus. It won't work. You cannot do it. And the same is true with God's righteous standard. We cannot truly follow it unless we love it. We can't love God's Word unless we love God. And that is just the way He's made us. Now, what else can we say about the believer? And in his law, he meditates day and night. Now you see the progression. Beyond the contrast with the wicked, which we've seen, we have the progression of the truth as it works its way into the life of the Christian. He loves the Lord so that he delights in his law. And in his law, because he delights in it, he meditates. Now, how do you meditate on the law of God? You read it, you memorize it, you ponder it. You speak it to others. You speak it to your own heart. You probably even dream about it if you fill your mind enough with it. You think about it in the night hours. 
And you let it change your heart over time to such an extent that you are transformed and you desire more of its work in your life. As a new believer, oftentimes you're getting into the Word is hard. You kind of have to labor and set alarms for yourself and just sort of make sure that you get to your daily reading. There's a, there's a certain honeymoon period where maybe it, when you're a first believer, you're going to just devour it. But over time, you see that God is wanting you to be more and more in His Word than even you were at the beginning. And you think to yourself, well, this is, uh, this is something I have to like get into. But what you realize is part of the difficulty of you coming to the Word is as somebody who's been saved and now no longer seeking after sin, the Word is going to address every sin in your life. The Word's going to address every idol in your life. Every part of your former rebellion and any, any part of your remaining rebellion, the Word of God is going to address. And that is a work that's sometimes painful. Luther once said that the Word of God cuts him off at every pass because his flesh desires something and the Word of God says no. And so there is a... There is a whittling that is happening there. There's a pruning that's happening there. There's a shaping that the Word of God does. But what you understand, dear Christian, as you get into the Word of God, is that the more that it shapes you, the more that you begin to want to be reshaped by God. The more that you want to have that renewal of the mind and the transforming of every thought and intention of your heart by the Word of God, by the Spirit of God. And so this is the idea. The godly one meditates on the Word of God. The godly one, more and more as he gets older, desires the Word. Elsewhere in Scripture, we actually see that to meditate on the Word of God is a command. So we've noticed in this psalm that they're all indicatives. These are just truths. The truth is that those who walk in this way Live and these who walk in this way perish. And these have joy and these do not. That's just the truth of the statement. But we find in Joshua 1 that this is framed in a command. And the Lord tells Joshua, this book of the law, speaking of the law of Moses, speaking of the word of God, every part of it, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it for then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. So he's saying the same thing as Psalm 1, but in a command form. And both things you have to understand. You are commanded to choose the righteous path, but you also are shown that the righteous indeed prospers. Now, I do believe many... Too many in the church are biblically illiterate. Many of society's ills are the fault of Christians who claim to be followers of Christ but who don't know their Bibles. How many good social institutions, many of the charities of today, were originally started as Christian institutions but over time drifted from their mooring points. They drifted from their anchoring points. Why? Because over time, illiterate, biblically illiterate people began to lead. They hired people for business acumen rather than biblical acumen. You can find many ministries and, and leaders of ministries have talked about this. Have they come to ministry after ministry and they've, what they've discovered is once their ministries grew to a certain point, they stopped hiring the theologian, they stopped hiring the preachers and teachers of God's word, and they began to hire businessmen who had no training in Bible and in very short order, those missions began to drift. Look at all of the major universities, especially the American universities, but also the British. Oxford, Cambridge, originally founded to teach the Word of God and to propound all of the sciences through a biblical lens. How about Harvard and Princeton, founded on biblical principles? Even when Princeton began to drift, many of its own faculty left and formed Yale. Why? Because they wanted a biblical principle to flourish in their faculty. But Yale has also drifted. All of these institutions, the moment they get their sights off of Christ, the moment they get their sights off of the Word of God, the moment that the people that they elevate are no longer theologically minded, spiritually minded, is the moment they begin to drift. And that's what we see everywhere. They don't know their Bibles. 
You, you will be absolutely blown away the more that you get into the Word of God, how it benefits you no matter what your career is, no matter where your work is, whether it's in the home with your children, whether you're in a Fortune 500 company, whether you're a small businessman, whether you're in some form of direct ministry in every area, if you are more biblically minded, you will be more decisive when you come to a crux, to some sort of scenario where you have to make a major decision. You'll be more ready to do what God would have you to do. He delights in God's Word. And also, verse 3, it says, He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. Will Varner says that blessing is found when we are saturated in the word and situated near the water. The tree metaphor has been applied to the believer in various ways through Scripture. Here it speaks of a healthy tree by streams of water. Streams are also important in Scripture because the stream is always flowing. It is not a stagnant pool. It is a life-giving, hydrating, nourishing water. And the tree that is by the water flourishes. You want to be near to the source. And of course, the source is Christ. The source is our Lord. The source is derived through Scripture. This is His Word to us. So stay near to the source. It says He will yield its fruit, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. The leaf withers that cannot draw enough water. And it's... Some of you maybe don't see this as often. If you live in an apartment or something, you're maybe not seeing as, as much of the, the workings of the farm or the way that plants come and go. You see it on the trees, of course. Maybe you see it in your house plants, especially when you're talking about perennial things where you really want this plant in the corner to survive, but somehow you can never get a plant in that corner to survive, and you're wondering what the trick is. The leaf always turns. Maybe the flower stops coming, whatever it might be. And so you're trying to figure out, it, does it need more water, less water? Does it need more light, less light? All of these things are factors. And the Bible says that if you walk in the way of the righteous, you're going to be like that tree that's planted by streams of water. And the implication is all the rest in the broad sunshine and all that is needed for life and health. And you produce your fruit. Of course, the Bible talks about fruit and we learn about fruit from Jesus, good fruit, bad fruit. But the point is that there's going to be fruitfulness from your ministry. And all of you, whatever your careers may be, you have a ministry in the church. And you can see nowadays how important your ministry is in the church. And if you can't see that, come and talk to me because nobody in the church is not vital. Nobody is not needed. We need every part to be working together so that we can serve Christ all as one. So he yields its fruit in its season, and in whatever he does, he prospers. And you, you see that switching back from the metaphor now to the one who trusts the Lord, to the one who follows his way. In whatever he does, he prospers. The story of Joseph is helpful here, because you can say that about his life. In whatever he does, he prospers. And it isn't that he didn't have trials or troubles. He was mistreated. He was sold to slave traders. He was imprisoned falsely. But the arc of his life is one of prosperity. Everyone that saw him in his day, and even as we read about him in our day, can see that God was with him for his good. God gave Joseph favor with himself and with men. And ultimately, he loved the God of his father Jacob, Joseph did. You and I, if we're honest, we are blessed. We're blessed. If we're the Lord's, we're blessed. If we're on this path, we are blessed. It doesn't matter that we're troubled. It doesn't matter that even in the past few years, world authorities have really clamped down on churches. None of that impacts the truth that we are blessed and that we prosper in the Lord. We prosper in the strength of His work and His Spirit, and we prosper because our faith endures. You can meet a lot of people that are very wealthy at the end of their lives and they have no, their children no longer talk to them. Their, their wives are somewhere else. They've had three or four of them because 
They haven't been able to focus on family. They, they've only been able to focus on what will produce success. And at the end of their life, if you were to talk to them and say, what would you give for your children and for your spouse or whatever you had? And, and, and many would definitely say they would rather have the relationships than all the money in the world. How many have regret because they've had worldly success, quote-unquote success, but it hasn't been success at all. And then you can find the poor widow at the end of her life having not a penny to her name, delighting in the joy of the Lord. She's faced many trials, many troubles, and yet she's been, been very much successful in the eyes of the Lord. And that's what matters. We don't care about what others say. We care about what the Word of God says. It just so happens also that in careers and ministries and other things, that if you do things according to the pattern of the Word of God, it also tends to lead to a success that results from diligence. It's not a guarantee. It's not a promise. But it's definitely true. I've, I talked to a restaurant manager one time in Los Angeles, and he was telling me he hired from the Christian university as well as from just off the street if somebody came in with a resume and he'd give them a shot. And he just said, you, you would not believe the difference, and it was a good university, you would not believe the difference in diligence and work ethic of the believer. They labor so hard to ensure the customer is satisfied. And the others, they could care less. So certainly there is a, a pattern there as well. But we should be seeking what is most important, and that is our spiritual blessing. Let me share a few more passages that speak of the righteous. Psalm 37, better is the little of the righteous than the abundance of many wicked. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. You see, the wicked will lose everything that they have in the end. They can't take it with them, but the righteous will inherit the land. Psalm 92, the righteous man will flourish like the palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon, you remember that the cedars in Lebanon in particular were used for the house of the Lord. Solomon built the house of the Lord with those cedars because they were so healthy and strong and beautiful. And so this is how the righteous is compared. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. Psalm 146, the Lord raises up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. Proverbs ten seven, the memory of the righteous is blessed but the name of the wicked will rot. How about that? The name of the wicked will rot. Everybody wants a legacy. Everybody wants to leave a name for themselves. But it will rot, says the Lord, if you are not in Him. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the m mouth of the wicked conceals violence. The wages of the righteous is life, the income of the wicked punishment. What the wicked fears will come upon him but the desire of the righteous will be granted. That's a very interesting verse about the wicked having the fears that he has come upon him. But you think about even we've been going through this whole climate cult and climate religion and this absolute abject fear that the world has of the end of the world. And the truth is the end of the world is coming and they should fear it, but for different reasons because judgment is coming and judgment will come upon them. But the righteous, we look at all of that and we say, oh, what you're seeing today, 94 degree temperature someplace in America being hot, look at the end of Scripture and you'll see what's going to come. Matthew 24 even shows that in the tribulation time, things are going to get really hot and really bad and earthquakes and famines and on and on and on. And you know what? The believer does not fear those things. We know what's coming. We know the church will be removed from that hour of trial, but we also know even the believers, even those who become believers in the tribulation period are going to be those who can have joy knowing what is before them. They will endure for a while and then they will have heaven and Christ himself. Proverbs eleven twenty eight says, He who trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like the green leaf. Proverbs fifteen twenty nine. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. That should encourage you, that God hears your prayers. Don't, don't ever be jealous of the, of the wicked. Don't ever be jealous of those who have what seems like it all, but don't have the Lord. If you have the Lord, you have everything. Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. 
The righteous runs into it and is saved. That's ultimately where we go. We are not righteous in ourselves. We find our righteousness in Christ. We do not have anything that could save us. It is in the Lord. But even in our momentary trials, even in persecution, our rescue is not ours to seize, but he is our strong tower. In him we're safe. He's our defender. He is the one we turn to. Next and finally, we look at the wind-blown wicked. The wind-blown wicked. Verse 4, the wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. Jesus spoke of the reapers which come for the harvest. They gather the grain, but the chaff is burned up with fire. So it is with the wicked. They are not like the righteous. They are not like the believer. Specifically, they are not like the healthy leaf and the, the fruit-producing tree. They are the stuff that drives up, dries up and is driven away. They do not produce fruit at the proper time. And when they do produce fruit, it is rotten to the core. I mentioned earlier that you will see people called Christians doing wicked things. And sometimes you'll see people that are in the world doing things that are apparently good. And of course, they can be objectively helpful, like in the case of charities that help orphans, charities that help refugees and those kinds of things. But with the unbeliever, there is always a motivation that is not centered in God and therefore is not centered selflessly. Only with the, the true faith in Christ is there fruit that is produced that is a genuine God-produced fruit. As men, they are not like the ones, these wicked who prosper in whatever they attempt to do. They fail in what matters. So they may prosper in meaningless things, worldly success, but they fail to do all of the things that are meaningly, meaningful. They fail to love their families righteously. They fail to love their neighbors righteously. They fail to love God as He is. Hebrews 11.6 teaches, Without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he who comes to God must believe that He is, and He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. Without faith it's impossible. You must believe in Christ if you are to please anyone, uh, to please God in, in truth. And of course, if you're to serve anyone in truth. If you can't believe God, I don't really care who you are, you're not successful. I don't care if you're a billionaire, a movie star, or a Nobel laureate. You're just a fool with a bank account, a tool of the enemy with a momentary sense of accomplishment, and you can't even take it with you. But here's the real issue for those who refuse to repent and who hate rather than delight in God's law. Verse 5, Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Listen to that great contrast. The one who trusts in the Lord, who refuses to stand in the way of sinners, we see that their end is good. But now the wicked who actually stood in the path of sinners now cannot stand before a holy God. Choose where you will stand, before God or before men. Are you with God or are you with men? The wicked will not be able to endure their judgment and ultimately will not stand in the assembly of the righteous. That is talking about the kingdom of God. There will be an everlasting assembly of the righteous before the God who sent His Son to save them. They will live in everlasting happiness. And the Bible says that this one, this wicked which is anybody who refuses Christ, will not stand among them, will not be among them, will not be in that joy. They have chosen their counselors. They have chosen their path. They have chosen their end. So now listen to what Scripture also says of the wicked. Psalm 9, verse 5. Speaking of the Lord, you, you have rebuked the nations, you have destroyed the wicked, you have blotted out their name forever and ever. Psalm 10, in pride the wicked hotly pursue the afflicted, let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. The wicked in the haughtiness of his countenance does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. And the psalmist then prays. Break the arm of the wicked and the evildoer. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. That's an idea of God going through the earth, 
seeking and destroying that which is evil. In the, in the Feast of Passover, there is a teaching in Scripture that the households of Israel were to go through and to seek out the leaven and remove it from the house. Here is God. He will seek out every little crumb of unrighteousness, every little detail, every little bit of wickedness. Psalm 11, upon the wicked he will rain snares. Fire and brimstone and burning wind will be the portion of their cup. Psalm 32, many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. Think about that. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. I thought you're promising me happiness. I thought that you're promising me as the world that if I just follow my lusts, if I follow the desires of my heart, I will have great happiness. Scripture tells me now that there is actually great sorrow if I follow my heart, if I follow you, if I go after wickedness. This is what you have to understand. And especially dear young person, you must understand this. You must know that many are the sorrows of the wicked. I could tell you story after story of those that I know, even those that I, that I know very dearly, who have just so gone far off the path and I would love to just see them restored. I'd love to have restored relationship between them and God, between them and, and myself and my family. But there are broken relationships. There are broken uh, relationships even in the world. There's destruction that's laid in the way. There's just a path of trouble. And all I can say is it's true. What God's Word says is true. And it's not true because I've seen it. It's true because God says it. I'm just telling you, I have also seen the evidence of that truth. It's all around us. We have biblical and extra biblical evidence galore. Psalm 119 says, You have removed all the wicked of the earth like dross. Therefore, I love your testimonies. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek your statutes. Proverbs 10 7, The memory of the righteous is blessed. But the name of the wicked will rot. How awful is that? How awful. Do not fret because of evildoers or be envious of the wicked. For there will be no future for the man, the evil man. The lamp of the wicked will be put out. Those are the many ways that the Bible speaks of the wicked. The problem today, I think, is that many who are living among the wicked don't see themselves that way. If you ask the average person on the street, are you a good person? Nine out of ten times, even maybe nine and a half out of ten times, they'll say, yes, I believe I'm a good person. And so part of our job is to show them Scripture, to show them this is not the case. Verse 6 of Psalm 1 says, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. And this is the summary. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. There are two ways to live and to walk. The way of the righteous or the way of the wicked, of life or destruction, there are no other ways. There are not 50 religions and Christianity is one of them. There is the biblical truth of Christianity and the way of wickedness. That's it. There are two ways. When you belong to the Lord, you will no longer live the way of the wicked, but the way of the righteous, the way of Holiness. The problem, though, with Psalm 1 is if you're looking for someone who perfectly fits this ideal of the righteous man, you will be disappointed. In fact, most people want to think of themselves as innately, naturally righteous, but we have a problem. Turn with me to Psalm 53. And look from verse 1, Psalm 53. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and have committed abominable injustice. But here's the, the situation. There is no one who does good. God has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there is anyone who understands, who seeks after God. Every one of them has turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. So we have a problem if we have a psalm that prays that God would seek out and destroy all the wicked 
And God from heaven says, I have looked upon the earth and I have seen that men are evil. What is the solution? How can we then be among the, the righteous here? Is there any hope? Can the wicked be saved? Turn with me to Isaiah. And we'll look at the 55th chapter. Look from verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. That is incredible. That is incredible. Everyone has committed evil. Everyone has sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. But the Lord himself has said, through Isaiah, if you turn to me, I will abundantly pardon. That, that term for abundantly pardon means complete forgiveness. Absolute wiping clean of your slate. No sins, no debt in your account. Forgiveness in full. Paul's joy is great in the New Testament as he shows how to get to hope, but he does so in the book of Romans by dragging us through three chapters of our sinful nature. If you, if you are not today convinced of your sinfulness, of your wickedness, and I say this even to the young people who tend to think, well, I'm not so bad, read Romans 1 through 3. And you cannot get through that portion of Romans without understanding, I myself have fallen short of the glory of God. I myself have sinned against God. I myself have been drawn astray. And I need somehow to be saved from that. That promise in Isaiah of repentance leading to salvation is true because Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Wages of sin as... Signed your death certificate. That, that's what's on the plate. You are, you are going to perish if you don't repent. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. If you turn to Christ, He freely pardons. And it is not just forgiveness, but the granting also of His righteousness. His righteousness is then imputed to you. Just as Abraham was believed God in Genesis 15, verse 6, it says he believed him and it says that God credited it to him as righteousness. It, he counted it. He affixed it to his account as righteousness. What did Abraham do? Did he labor? No. He did no work. He did no good works. He was a sinner like you and I. But he believed God. He believed in the promise of God and he was saved. Jesus Christ is the only man who was never drawn into sin. He never took counsel from the wicked. He never walked in their evil path. He never sat in the seat of scoffers. In fact, he was nailed to a cross between two thieves who used the place of their own death as the seat of their scoffing. And yet one of those sinners so engrossed in his sin that he began to die a scoffer yet near the end rebuked his fellow thief and understood that Jesus was the king who was dying innocently for crimes he did not commit. And if you remember what he said to Jesus, he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did Jesus say to him? This day shall you be with me in paradise. Had that thief done anything to earn his salvation? Had he even obeyed the law or done anything like that? No, he, he got the first matter straight. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Savior. Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the only one through whom salvation has come to us. Believe in him and you will have eternal life. That man believed and in the moment he believed, Christ could say to him in truth, 
Today you'll be in heaven. You'll be fine. You'll be okay. You'll, in fact, eventually stand with the assembly of the righteous. The other thief did not come to his senses at his death. His life of rebellion ended with him blaspheming God and his slander of his son. Don't wait to death to find out if you'll receive mercy or judgment. Don't wait for that day. It's not even like it's a 50-50 chance. You don't know. Both of them could have died. It was just in the mercy of God that one of them was saved. But if you know that you're a sinner and you know that you're not Christ, I would turn to Him this moment, even in your heart, and just confess your sin to Him. Lord, I'm a sinner. Save me. I know that I don't deserve heaven. I deserve hell. Save me. God will change your heart. God will do that work in you. Self-destruction isn't an event. It's a path. When you understand that, then you know that there is a path which leads to life and a path which leads to death. There's a path which leads to life and it begins with Jesus as Lord. It continues in the counsel and fellowship of the redeemed. It takes the narrow way and leads to eternal blessing. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for sending Your Son, the Righteous One, Jesus Christ, who perfectly embodies the happy, blessed, Righteous One, who is the only One who lived without sin, and who yet now is the model for all who believe. We are more blessed even in the church than they were when they received this psalm after the exile, Lord, your people, because since the giving of this psalm, your son has become our example. And so now we don't look at this psalm and say, Lord, we love you. We love your word. Teach us because we have no earthly example. Now we can say, Lord God, teach us your way. We do have an earthly example in the Son of Man and Son of God. He is truly man and He is truly God. He is the one that has lived the life that we could never live. And so, Lord, we give You all praise and glory and honor for Him. And all praise and glory and honor for Your Word. What a delightful book, the Psalms. If this book won't delight us with Your Word, I don't know what book will. It's such a treasure, Lord. It's always been a treasure to your people, to your people Israel and to your people in the church, Jew and Gentile alike. Even through the ages, the church has sung these psalms, even as the ancients did. Lord, would you make this Psalter again a delight for us? Would it be something that we could turn to in our times of distress, in our times of sorrow, in our times of sadness, in our times of affliction? Would you use it in our lives to remind us of the praise that is due our King? And it's in His name we pray. Amen.